Statistics and Excel. Bell curve. People's weight data example. Got data? Let's get stuck into it with statistics and Excel. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our Accounting Rocks product line. If you're not crunching cords using Excel, you're doing it wrong. A must-have product. Because the fact, as everyone knows, of accounting being one of the highest forms of artistic expression means accountants have a requirement, the obligation, a duty to share the tools necessary to properly channel the creative muse. And the muse, she rarely speaks more clearly than through the beautiful symmetry of spreadsheets. So get the shirt, because the creative muse, she could use a new pair of shoes. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. You're not required to, but if you have access to OneNote, we're in the icon left hand side. OneNote presentation 1626 bell curve people wait example tab. We're also uploading transcripts to OneNote so you can go to the view tab, immersive reader tool, change the language if you so choose so that you can either read or or listen to the transcripts in multiple different languages, tying in the timestamps to the actual video presentations. OneNote desktop version here. In prior presentations, we've been thinking about how we can represent different data sets, both with mathematical representations, such as the average or mean, the median, the mode, quartiles, and pictorial representations, like the box and whiskers, the histogram. The histogram being the primary tool we visualize when thinking about the spread of the data, being able to use descriptive terms to describe the spread of the data on a histogram, such as the data is skewed to the left, the data is skewed to the right. We then wanted to think of formulas to graph lines or curves that may in certain cases approximate the actual data sets. Whenever we can do that, it would be great to do that because the formulas allow us to have more predictive power over whatever the data set is representing. We've talked about different kinds of data that might conform to different curves in the past, such as a uniform distribution, binomial distribution, Poisson distribution, exponential distribution, for example. We're continuing on with the most famous of them, the normal or bell curve uh, type of distribution. Remembering that not all data is going to conform to any of these types of distributions. We could have a completely uh, data that just has no pattern that could be represented by a simple curve. But many things could be represented in nature. And when we're thinking about bell curves, a lot of things in nature like heights, like weights, like if we're thinking about how close estimates are to a particular thing, these are often things that might be represented by a bell curve. Now, if you don't have any actual data to practice with, you might want to check out Kaggle.com to, to get some data sets to practice with in Excel, or you can actually create your own data sets using a tool in Excel that we have talked about in prior presentations. So this time, here's going to be our data on the left where we have height data and weight data. One of the primary differences with this data set than in prior data sets that we have looked at is that we have a whole lot more data this time, which means that if we're talking about something that will conform to a bell curve, it's more likely that if I create a histogram, the pictorial representation of the data, then it's gonna look more bell-shaped because we have a whole lot more data. If we have less data, it still might be something that should conform to basically a bell-shaped distribution, but we don't have as much data to kind of represent. It's not going to look like as much of a bell shape, even though it, it might be clustered more jaggedly in a bell shape uh, type of position. Also, we're going to do a little bit different uh, graphs in terms of graphing our bell curve to ask questions such as, what if we're talking about the area under the curve at the top of the curve or at the bottom of the curve or in the middle? All right, 
So this is our data, same kind of thing that we'll, we'll, we've done in the past. We want to then look at the data and say, does this data conform to a bell curve type of distribution? And if it does, then we can plot the actual bell shape distribution and ask questions about it uh, from there. So we're going to take the mean of the data, which is simply the average of the data. This would be the formula in Excel, taking the weights. We're looking at the weights here, all of the numbers divided by the count of the number and the average in pounds is 127 pounds on the average. The standard deviation then is calculated this way. Standard deviation for the population uh, in this case is just gonna be all of the weights and uh, that gives us 11.66, a measure of the spread of the data. The median, which is the one in the middle calculated thusly with this formula equals the median of this data if we were to sort the data from bottom to top then it would be the one in the middle picking the one in the middle which is 127 pounds about that's quite close to the mean which is an indication that this data might conform to a bell curve so at this time we're saying hey look it's weights so that's something in nature I'm already thinking this might conform to a bell curve based on my intuition there. Then the mean is the same as the median. That's another indication. If I take the mode, which is the one that's going to be the number represents or comes up multiple times, I'm looking at this formula, just the single mode. Note that it's a little less likely if we didn't have so much data that the mode uh, would be useful because we, we have... Uh, decimal points so 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 that means that if we didn't have a whole lot of data it would be less likely that we got we got a whole lot of multiple occurrences of the same exact measurement because we're pretty detailed on the measurements whereas if we didn't have the decimal points then then it would be quite likely that the mode would be very useful because uh, we would have uh, multiple of the same number more likely even with a smaller data set but because we have such a large data set in this case then uh, we even the mode is still relevant and it's pretty close to the mean which is another indication that this might conform to a bell-shaped curve so if we were to plot this I think I plotted this down here it looks like this so this is a histogram so we have that middle point over here and you can see that it doesn't look like a smooth curve because it's still a histogram, but because we have a, a lot more data, then it's looking a lot more bell-shaped than some of our other curves. Remember that even if we were looking at weights and we had a lot less data, then, then it still would conform to like packed up in the middle, but it would look a lot more jagged due to the fact that we don't have as much data to, to be representative. So, uh, so we're saying, okay, it looks a lot like it's gonna conform to a bell curve now. So now we're gonna say, all right, well then let's plot this thing out and look at the smooth curve uh, or, or the graph that we can make based on our, our formula or our plotting of the X. So I'm gonna say, let's, let's plot this out using our norm.dist. We want to take the X's. Now, where am I going to start the X's? This is our common questions we've run into in prior presentations. We're looking at pounds. So I might say, well, why don't I start at zero pounds and go up to a number of pounds like 500 or something? <laughs> and so they're unlikely they're going to hit 500 pounds. That would be quite heavy of an individual. But it's also unlikely it's going to go down to zero. So we probably don't want to start at zero so where do we want to start? Well, we know that if we go four standard deviations, that's going to take the vast, vast majority, almost 100% right, of the data uh, for, our, even though it goes on forever, uh, the bell curve in theory on the tails, but the vast majority of the data will be in there. So we're going to say, so let's do the four standard deviations, which is what we've done in the past. So the lower bit then is going to be the standard deviation of 11.66, times four, four standard deviations, 46, 64 minus the mean will take me to the lower end. So I'm going to say minus 127.08, and that gives us our 80.44. So I don't need to go down to zero pounds. I can go down to 80. There are not many people that are 80 pounds that are not in, you know, trouble or, or you know, a full adult at, at the 80 pounds is not general 
So then if I go the other way, 11.66 times four is 46.64 plus the middle point of 127.08, we get 173.72. Now there are, you would think, you know, there might, so our data set is going up to uh, one set 173 on the high end. So we're gonna say, okay, that'll be the high point of uh, the data that we're using. So I'm gonna say, all right, then if I go over here, we can say the X's are just gonna go from 80 on up to that, to, to, that, to that high point of 174, and that should capture the data that we need to be plotting in the graph. Then we can do our P of X's, which is our norm.dist formula, norm.dist, the X, in this case, 80, the mean standard deviation are gonna be these two numbers, the 12708, the mean standard deviation, 1166 in our formula, and we do not want it to be cumulative. That's what's being represented by the zero. So if I do this all the way down, you could say, for example, this one, what's the likelihood that we have someone at 93 pounds given our normal distribution 0.05 percent what's the likelihood that we have someone at 96 pounds given this 0.1 percent so notice that the questions that we're likely to ask are what's the likelihood that we have someone on the high end maybe that's like 148 pounds or above or what's the likelihood that we have someone at uh, 110 pounds and below, uh, for example, those so those so you might think that we could sum these up, but you can't do that exactly typically because we're talking about the area under the curve. Although that will give you an approximation. Now we could compare this to our actual data set. So our actual data set over here is counting. We're imagining that this is counting an actual distribution, right? So we're going to say that these are actual numbers in pounds but this is in percents so what i'd like to do is count my my data over here and then convert it into percents so i'm going to do my frequency distribution so for example this frequency distribution i want to say what's how many people in our sample or in our population have greater than 84 pounds up to and including 85 pounds three of them how many people are over 85 pounds up to and including 86 pounds? Two people. The frequency formula is up top, which is taking the frequency of the data array. It's a fancy array formula. And that's gonna be this, all of this data. And then it's taking the, the other side is uh, the, the bends, which are the X. And then it spills out, it's a spill formula, these, this data the total of all of this data if i add it all up notice at 146 we had 239 in our data set for it if i add it up we come up to 25,000 data points so i didn't put all those data points in here uh because i only went down to here but in excel it went on to 25,000. so in other words if i was to count this data with a formula of count this excel count every line just count them 25,000. that's why we have a lot of data that's why when we graphed it we have a pretty smooth graph and we can verify that those data have been properly put into bins at least to some degree by the fact that the total down here should tie out to the number of data points at 25,000, which are now being allocated to the bins then we can say okay i could take my data for example here and say what's the likelihood of someone being 90 percent based on the bell curve versus my actual data well i could convert the bell curve times the 25,000. 25,000 times 0 0.9 0 0.009 because it's 0.9 percent and i get the uh 225 which is pretty close what what's the likelihood i could take my 25,000 times the 0 0.0235 and I get pretty close to that 558. Or I can take my actual data and convert it into a percent by taking each of these divided by the total. So I can take, for example, let's go down here where we have some larger numbers. Let's take this one and say, I'm gonna take my count 
the actual count, 220, divided by the total, 25,000. And that gives us, if we move the decimal two places over, the 0.88. This one is 207 divided by 25,000 gives us the, if I move the decimal two places over, 0.83% about. And if I add up all the percentages, they should add up to 100%. I didn't do the total down here, but they should add up. So then I can look at the differences between the, the likelihood based on our, our norm.dist versus our actual data. And that could ver further confirm whether or not we are tied into a bell curve uh, type of situation. Then we have the Z-score. Now the Z-score is kind of like another representation or different representation other than the X, meaning the amount around the mean. So remember we're talking about, if I look at a, a bell curve, we're talking about the middle point would be in here and the Z-score would be zero if we're in the middle, negative numbers down below, positive numbers above, numbers greater than or less than zero, are going to be less normal. Normal would be in the middle. So we're going to say, all right, how do I calculate the z-score? That's going to be each x, in this case, 80, minus the middle point. Uh, hold on a sec. 80 minus the middle point, which is the mean. So minus uh, the 127.08, and then divide by the spread number, the standard deviation, 11.66. Right there, that gives us our negative 4.04. Uh, now, notice that's that's unusual because it's it's quite it's way far lower than the middle point, and you can see now it's getting closer to normal because it's going towards zero. It gets to zero around where our mean is, one 127 to 128, and then it goes above. So now we're getting less and less normal on the high end. So in this case, the high end representing more weight, higher weight, the low end is less weight. So, so usually with these normal distributions, we want to be, the normal is usually good, right? Because you want to be kind of normal, norm, usually. Not, but obviously, when you're looking at weight, then if you're going to be abnormal in terms of more healthy by more muscular or something like that, then of course you might have be away from the, the norm based on that. And again, you might look at different distributions of people who have different, you know, body mass, more, more muscle versus fat or whatever that could, could say, say what's on average for a, a particular type of athlete and so on. But normal is usually kind of, you know, the baseline, of course, which is kind of good <laughs> uh, uh, normally. All right. So then uh, we, we could then ask these kind of questions such as, uh, let's see, this one, P of X is greater than or equal to 133. So if we're looking at our, our graph over here, we're saying, if I look at this graph, this, by the way, is graphing, is graphing this P of X and the actual data as a percent so that we can put them kind of on top of each other. And we can see that the actual data lines up pretty closely to the curve in this case, which is an indication that the curve would be uh, have good predictive power. So now we're looking, we're trying to find another way to graph our 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 curve in an area graph this time, which might help us to use one graph to that could vary possibly between different scenarios. So we have a question of something being above. Uh, would be the blue part. So I can kind of look at this line. And if it was below, I can look at this line and below. And if it was between, I can look at basically uh, the between area. So, so here's our questions here. This one, this question is a question for us to have it greater than or equal to 133. So if 133 is here, we're looking at the blue kind of above uh, that point. Okay, so if we visualize that, we're going to say, all right, well, then it's going to be above. So I have to use one minus. Why? Because remember that I can only go from left to right and use the cumulative. So I can't go from right to left. So if I'm going, uh, if I'm looking at this blue area on this side, I have to say I'm going to take the whole thing 
minus everything up to this point, which will leave me this bit, the whole thing being 100%. 100% is what the area is under the curve. 100 represented by 1 minus the norm.dist of the x, which is the 133, comma, the mean, and the standard deviation, 127, 11.66, comma, cumulative. Yes, it needs to be cumulative. Okay, and then I could say, well, what if I do this in terms of z-scores instead of x? So let's convert that x to a z-score. That would be 133 minus the middle point, which is the mean of 127.08 divided by 11.66. So the z-score then is about 0.51. So if I knew the Z score, which is a little bit over, you know, it's over the middle point, which would be zero higher than the middle point of that, then I can use a similar formula, which would be one minus norm dot S dot dis. All I need is the Z because the X mean and standard devi deviation have been kind of combined together when we calculated the Z and it once again is cumulative. We get to the same result of the 30.58. Okay, so then I can do this kind of question. X is less than 109. So if I go over here and say, okay, well, if X is less than, I can look at these. So notice if, well, let me graph this first. Let's graph this other one. X is greater than uh, 133 or P of Z is greater than uh, uh, 0.51. Then this is gonna be if logic test and we're picking up this X and saying if it's greater than or equal to, and we're picking up the 133, then comma, what do we want you to do? We want you to give us the P of X. But if it's not, then we want you to just put blank there, which is double quotes, text field with nothing in the middle. We could have done the same thing with the Z score of, of uh, 0.15, right? The Z score or the X. And then there's nothing in it until we get down to uh, way down to here, which is the 133. And if I graph this on top of what I had on this side, then it's going to give me it's going to give me that that separation. So now let's but let's go to this one. We want X to be less than or equal to the 1009. So less than. So if if we had 109 right here, we're looking at the blue side in this case, we want it to be less than. Now, because the cumulative is up to and including that point, we could just say up to and including that point. Remember that you might also say if it's 109, you might say, well, look, 109 is right here. Why don't I just sum up from 109 down to here? Because I can do that easily in Excel, but that'll be an approximation, not exact, because we're looking at the area under the curve, you know, so. You, to be exact, you'd want the formula. So we could do the formula over here and it'd be, be looking like this. It would be equal to the norm dot dist. The X is the 109, the mean standard deviation, 127.08 and 11.66. Do we want it cumulative? We do, therefore a one, and we get that 6.05. We can also take the Z score. So if we represent X as a Z now, the 109, I'm going to convert to a Z by subtracting it minus the middle point of 127.08 pounds divided by the standard D, 11.66. And we get to that uh, negative 1.55. Then I can use my norm.s.dis to get to the same 6.05 using just the Z and it being cumulative, the Z now taking into account has combined together in X essence, the X, the mean and the standard D. All right, so now let's take the middle question. So now we're gonna say, well, what if uh, P of X, X is less than the 133 and it's greater than the 109. So if I was to, if I was to look at that over here and say, okay, well now, now we have it less than less than i think if it was less than here and greater than here 109 133 it's the orange area so so that's no so how would we how would we do that well i can only cum i can only add it up up to a certain point with the cumulative so i would have to add the higher end up to here 
and then subtract out the cumulative of the blue area in order to back into the orange area. So I'd have the whole thing up to here, all of the orange, and then minus this blue bit. So notice that if I, let's first think about how I graphed this one. This is X is less than or equal to 109. So that's gonna be our if calculation up top. So if we're gonna say logic test, this 80 is greater than or equal to the 109, then what do you wanna do? Pick up the P of X. If it's not, comma, what do you do? Put a blank thing. So now you've got data from here down to here, and then it's all blank. So if I graph this, so I, you can imagine I graph this on top. So I have another, another layer on top of my graph here. And then this last one over here, we're going to say that, uh, and also I have, I have a dynamic headers that we talked about last time. I won't go into that in detail here, but this last one, the middle bit is going to be the norm dot dist of the top part, which is the, which is going to be the, the higher X, the 133. Uh, and then the mean standard deviation, it needs to be cumulative minus the norm dot dist of the lower X, the 109, the same mean standard deviation, it also needs to be cumulative. And then if we converted that to, uh, or this, I can also think about it uh, this way, one minus the two, the two results that we got uh, up top. In other words, uh, if I look at my data up top, we did P of X is greater than 133. Uh, P of X uh, is greater is less than or equal to 109. So if I look at those two, and I think about this, I guess I'm gonna say, okay, P of X was greater than uh, the the 109 and less or I'm sorry. <laughs> let, me do, let me do that again. What were my two P, P of X is greater than equal to 133 and less than or equal to 109. So those are the two tails, right? Those are the two ends. Greater than the 133, less than the 109. Those are the two blue sides. So if this the whole thing adds up to 100%, and then I have these two blue sides, so I can subtract that out. I can say 100% minus those two. In other words, I'm gonna say this is gonna be the 30.58 plus the 6.05 minus 100%, and I should get that middle part of the 63.37. So that's another way to kind of envision that. And then I could say, okay, the Z scores. So what if I had the Z scores? I can do this with the Z calculations, getting to the Zs uh, in the same way, I won't, I won't, you know, it's going to be the 133 minus the mean divided by the standard deviation will give us the Z's. And then you can do the Z in the same way, norm.s.dist with the Z scores, cumulative minus norm.s.dist with the Z scores of uh, the lower Z score, and you'll get to the same thing. You can also do the same thing with the Z scores that we got to, to get to that same 63 37. So this is the probability uh, of the lower end. So before I before I do that, just note that when I look at this graph, then this last bit, then is P of X is less than or equal to 133. And over the 109, we have our dynamic header that we'll show how to do in Excel. And one way I can do this now is instead of me uh, redoing this whole graph based on the the information to the left i can say well look i'm going to i'm going to sum these two up because this is the upper and lower ends and i'm going to say if so i want you to do an if and then i'm going to sum up these two if the sum of that is greater than 0 then what do we want you to do we want you to put a we want you to put nothing over here double quotes if not then we want you to put the the uh, the number, or then we want you to put the P of X. So by doing that, I can then get this middle part that's being graphed. So now we're graphing that middle part. So the point of this is that now we have this kind of one graph that might be able to help us 
uh, and be dynamic to a answer any of these questions. We can kind of say, okay, the high end is over here and I can kind of use this graph to envision if I want to look at the tail on the high end, I can use the same graph if I wanted to ask a question on the low end. And then if I want to ask a question about the middle, I can use the same graph to basically plot the middle point because by the way, I'm entering it into the system here. I can, I can enter either, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that this is always the, you know, the top and the low point, and this is gonna be the middle. So we'll do that in Excel if that's something of interest. So to, to, try to, to try to get kind of one graph that'll be a little bit dynamic once you put it together so that you can visualize multiple of these kind of questions. Now, another question that, you, that we haven't really looked at as much is like the probability of the lower end. What if we know the probability of the lower end is 45% and I'm trying to then find the X value or the Z value. So in other words, I know that this, uh, this probability of this end uh, is, I know that, that area under the curve and I'm trying to find the point then of the X value or the Z value, this value on the X. So if we ask a question like that, then we can use a formula, which would be norm dot inverse INV. And then the data input will be picking up the probability instead of the X value, and then the same mean and standard deviation. And that will give us then the X value. Same with the Z, the Z value. So if I know the 45%, I'm now backing into the Z value, right? It's like kind of reversing the algebra, but doing it with a formula. So now we're gonna solve for the inverse, norm.s.inverse. And now all I need is the probability, which is the 45%, because the mean and the standard devi deviation are kind of included in that Z value calculation. And that gives us our, our Z value of the 0.13, the 0.13 and 125. You'll note, if I look at the graph, so the 0.13 and the 125 would be somewhere around here, right? They're line, they're the, kind of the same, they're at the same point. Or if I look at 125 over here and I look at the Z value, 125 and 0.18 about, right? It's between, because there's rounding involved. So, so there is that. And then we're gonna say, okay, what's the probability of the upper end? So notice that these two are kind of the inverse. So 45 and 55 add up to 100. What if we're looking, what if I know then like the upper end, like this blue area, this isn't the exact number, but you know the upper end, then then how do I back into like the related, the related X or Z? So we can say, okay, that's gonna be another inverse, but now you'd have to take the norm dot inverse, same thing, but the probability now is going to be 100% or one minus the probability here. So one minus the 55 and then comma the mean and standard deviation. And that'll give you, that'll give you the, the uh, X. And then if you wanted the Z value, same concept, we would pick, take the norm dot S dot inverse one minus the, the 55. And then you get to, to this value and they're the same numbers because of we chose the 45 percent and uh and the uh 55 percent so so obviously if you're saying the the probability of something that is the lower end 45 percent means that the upper end is the 55 percent which means you end up on the same x value uh which is going to be the 125 and uh the 61.